Hey guys, welcome back to Twitch's Kerbal Space Program, where we join Rich Mulkerman flying over the surface of the moon like some sort of discarding NASA probe trying to find water in the southern craters. Hey guys, how's it going? So I left you with this scene last time and gave you a little bit of a, a, a cliffhanger, shall we say, so like going, can we land it, can we not? More importantly, can we land this where we want to land it? You'll see that I'm doing slightly off axis burns here because I'm trying to get my trajectory, as demonstrated lovely by the map page here, uh, over towards the uh, navigation markers down in those corners there. Now, with a little bit of a right click and a, and a bringing up my, my uh, active navigation marker on my ball, because that's where I keep my inactive navigation markers. Um, I start thinking about how fast I want to be hitting down onto the floor. Now, obviously, my main aim here is to be going forward quite fast, but not down very fast, because I want to travel. I want to travel the surface of the moon as much as possible, but I don't want to slam into it too fast. Because whilst these landing gears are great for landing, um, and and believe me, they really are really good for landings. They're not exactly all that great at like high impact landings. You'll notice right now on screen that I'm trying to do a crew report. Unfortunately, I am too low down on altitude to be able to do that. So I need to bring myself to a stop. Uh, I needed to be above uh, 10,000 meters to be able to do it at this particular navigation point. So my main, my main things that I'm keeping an eye on here are obviously my vertical mark, uh, vertical speed indicator up at the very top there. Uh, also, I am kind of worried about my horizontal speed because, you know, I don't want to be like spending forever trying to stop just a little way. So we're going to come in for a nice soft touchdown because we overshot and it's time to do that sort of thing. This is, of course, my first in the field landing, so anything could happen here. But I am feeling relatively confident as we are down to less than 20 meters per second um, flight time. There we go. Brilliant. Touchdown happened well, and we're just going to wait for our brakes to mark it out. Now, I took a little bit of a break here, and you'll notice that when we come back, you'll see up there, possibly saw up there in that, that list of stuff, we are actually within the zone. Uh, of, uh, what is it, 3ST25, the one that we need to be above uh, 10,000 meters for and uh, to get our crew report. So I just kind of push myself up in the air. Uh, I, I think this will be the way to do this. Um, and unfortunately, for some reason, it doesn't. Even when I'm this far above, it doesn't. And that leads me to go, today's episode was supposed to be all about Rich Mill Kerman, like being an absolute badass and finishing his mission and just being the glory and like stomping all over Jeb. Unfortunately, things didn't quite go according to plan. So today's ep episode is actually gonna be about how not trying to look stupid, in fact, makes you turn out to look like some sort of mentally backwards baboon smashing his face onto a keyboard, which is actually how I felt for the vast majority of this mission here. So anyway, uh, right now I'm just like, why isn't it working? I'm doing everything I can. I'm fly floating above it. I'm at on exactly on the point, or I was exactly on the point while I was doing it. I was like, oh, well, this isn't gonna work and I am fast running out of fuel, so I really need to put this thing down before I just kill Rich Mole and everything goes wrong. So that's fine, we're just going to let ourselves float down to the ground. A little bit worried about uh, how uneven the ground underneath us might be, but we'll nail our vertical speed and then just try and get the horizontal speed to be a perfect touchdown just like that. Uh, I, I, it's amazing. I, um, I'm blown away with how good I was at, at this. So we're going to change our drive um, capabilities. We've turned off the underneath engine, so we're no longer going to fly. And we're just going to scoot along on the power of this back engine here, which I feel should be relatively easy. All we need to do is bounce along and not take too many solid hits. And then this crater happened. Um, so I'm like, okay, well, whatever. I just I need to go this way. So if I just keep my my vertical speed uh, roughly zero, I should be able to go from one crater lip to the other. And I thought this was a fairly solid plan at the time. Unfortunately, I didn't quite get on the uh, keeping myself buoyed up enough. But that's all right. We land on our landing gear, and everything kind of goes all right. We keep keep control, and then for no reason, I explode on the ridge, and I was annoyed at this so we do a quick load to put the uh, alone ranger back where he was before we started taking off and we come back to the bang zoom now we know this can make it to the moon all right we've done this once before but this is all old technology here so what we need to do is just give it a bit of a revamp uh first off we didn't need two fuel port port few ports on there we only needed one fuel port on there uh, and then i very quickly realized we don't actually need the stay puck we have a much better um probe core somewhere 
There we go, the, the, the Probodyne, um, amazing. We stick some um, solar panels on the side and then I'm like, wait, whoa, 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 we've got a, a very restricted part count here. What we should be doing is putting the most efficient stuff that we on as we can. Uh, and that is not the single cells here. What we actually need is to put on the, uh, the big cells. Uh, the the multi cells, sorry, the ones that are like six by two wide. Uh, I also put this big battery on the top, and I will change that because I realised that the Kerbals can't pick that up, and that will become important later on. Uh, so this is the Bang Zoom Two. It's time to go to the launch, and I'm like, oh, it's night time. This is horrible. Let's uh, quickly time accelerate our way through. I mean, we don't really care about the uh, the landing conditions, but this takeoff condition is all important, of of course. Uh, so there we go, we've, we've gone through the entire night and we're just going to come down towards the day again. Not overly impressed with where the moon is compared to Kerbin, like we've now got to go off the night side, but that's no problem. And why isn't my SAS firing up? What's going on here? Of course, we've just spent all night going through everything, our electric charge is going to be down. So we quickly like recover the vessel and put another one in. I cut all that out for you because no one needs to watch that. And we're going off to orbit. So this is a fairly standard procedure at this point here. I mean, we boost our way up and perform a gravity turn. Uh, once we're up out of the atmosphere, we try and keep our apple apps as low as possible while circularizing our burn. And indeed, wait until we go round a circular orbit and see the moon rising above the horizon before we thrust for all we're worth because we know that this makes us miss. Ah, oh, we're miles away. But no bother, I did a quick save on the launch pad, so we'll bring her back and we'll make the same launch. Uh, we will even, on the way there, have a look at the Majestic Eye and see how much of the map is filled out. As it turns out, it is an incredible amount. We time warp our way up to the moon's um, sphere of influence and realise that we didn't deploy our solar panels, so we are completely stuffed here. You would have thought I would have been bored of this particular mission by this point, and indeed, actually, I am more than a little bit bored of it by this point, but I took a little break and we've launched this one again. Uh, we get ourselves out to the sphere of influence. Everything goes incredibly well, actually. We have a real close periaps down at the surface of the moon, so close, in fact, that we can start, like, adjusting ourselves real close to our landing points and try and get where we want to go. And now you notice these outside fuel tanks are quite low on fuel. This is... Uh, incredibly like the the plan uh, we intend to get rid of those as we're coming in for landing and hopefully you only use the smallest bit of that central fuel tank uh, for the actual landing as you know we need to use that all in our uh, rover okay so we're coming up for uh, a, a new staging here and uh, everything I am feeling confident, supremely confident. I'm even thinking about getting my landing gear out because we we're so close to the floor. The one thing we need to do is just perform this explosive staging that completely destroyed my entire vessel literally the only thing i've got left are solar panels a probe core and um that that battery there like i've got no way of saving this at all there are there are no rockets there's no rcs the only thing i can do is flap myself around like th there's not even any air resistance to try and bring myself down slowly somewhere we're just gonna have to watch this and all the bits all these bits indeed look at this one spazzing out there uh come down to the surface and uh, you know at five kilometers not long to wait explosions all around ah. so the next version of this craft number four if you're keeping count uh, has got itself into this sort of encounter with the moon obviously that is a bit further away than i would particularly like and i have a question for my uh technical advisors out there i'm sure you guys know who you are so i want to move my periapsis both further south and closer to the mun here. Now, I know obviously I want to be making an anti-radial burn to move my periapsis further south, but do I want to be making a retrograde or a radial burn to bring that periapsis down when I'm in this particular point? Because obviously I am not up at my Apple app, so I don't think retrograde is going to be the most efficient, but I also know radial burns are just inefficient anyway. So yeah, Answers on a postcard, please. Uh, best answers, get a reply in the comment section. Woo! So with all my orbital manoeuvres finished, I decide that it's time to spin up to get rid of these uh, side tanks here, as last time, obviously, it completely blew me away. Um, I I'm assuming that all the fuel inefficiencies leading me to jump dump those tanks earlier on is all to do with the fact that I had such a far away periaps as opposed to, you know, all my burns being inefficient. 
I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll see how that one pans out afterwards. But what we really need to do is try and get my orbit going right over the top of this rover here. We need to get as close as possible because the closer I am, the less chance there is of me just blowing everything up. Unless I'm too close, of course. But the chances of that are slimmer than anything else. And we see from this particular shot here that I did actually get very close. Uh, we're, we're coming in... Um, almost right on top. I think we overshot by something like seven kilometers. Which, which, you know, if I made the landing would have been great. But for some reason, I decided that 10 kilometers was the place for a suicide burn. And let me tell you, it is not. Thankfully, I had done another quick save in orbit around the Mun. Um, possibly not the most efficient one to have done a quick save on, but we're there now. That's much better than any of the other missions had done, so yeah. Uh, and I decided to take it a little bit more gently. We made sure that we were slowing down a lot quicker. No suicide burns here, just general um, safe burns, decelerating ourselves nice and early, and we got to put down gently on the night side here. Yeah. So during one of my many trips to the Space Center, I had noticed that the um, contract to place the, the flag on the Mun was actually starting to run out of time. Uh, it had something like four hours left. So we had to make sure we went and got that. Uh, I also take took a moment to have a quick look around and see if there are any um, contracts that enabled us to put satellites in orbit around the Mun. Unfortunately, there were not. Um, and the reason I want that contract will hopefully be obvious after this scene here. So it's time to get Rich Mal out because he's been there all night and I, I feel this really needs to have some sort of commemorative flag or something like that. This is indeed our first night on the Mun. If you remember Jebediah and Bill, I mean, they were there for some time, but I never got to see the darkness on the Mun, which to me screams that they weren't there for that long. Though, thinking about all the things that happened in between them landing and then having the science to get them off, I should imagine they did. But this is our first player-based night on the Mun. Uh, and indeed, we need a flag to commemorate such things. So we are going to call this site the massively creative name, a Lone Ranger Night Base Number One. Uh, with a little personal note from Rich Mal here, he would like a map, which I think for the single person that's going around and doing all the business on the Mun is quite a reasonable request. To that end, we've taken the Majestic Eye. We have retrofitted it with a radar altimeter because we want to get more than just the biome data. Uh, that was a little problem that I had with the original Majestic Eye. Nothing unsurmountable. Like I say, we just need to throw a radi uh, radar altimeter on there. And we're going to go launch. Now, according to the Kerbal Engineer there, the stack, uh, the, the tiny stack engine that we use to put this in orbit around Kerbin should actually be enough to put it in orbit around the Mun. I'm dubious, but let's trust the numbers and let's go for it. Well, what do you know? It worked. Um, so we've just come into the sphere of influence of the Mun here, and I did slightly overshoot here, putting us into a nice retrograde orbit, which I actually quite nice. Uh, I actually quite like. Um, not many of my vessels end up in retrograde orbit, so I, I think just having one there to cause like double the velocity damage when it smashes into stuff will be a, a, an interesting challenge. Uh, I try and put it into as close a polar orbit as possible because if you remember from when we had a look at the map from the actual Majestic Eye round Kerbin, we were missing the poles. And whilst that is like all right if we're just exploring our home planet, if we're looking at other planets, I think we want to be able to see everything everywhere. It's not too unreasonable, isn't it? Especially when we're trying to give this actually as a roadmap to a Kerbal that is on the pla on the planet's face. So the only real things that I need to do to make sure this functions as good as possible is to make sure that my periaps is about 250 kilometers, which at the moment I had actually managed to push it a little bit low. Uh, that's no problem. We're just going to spin ourselves around so we're looking at our uh, pro grade, then boost a little bit up. Um, like I say, we're at 190 kilometers, so we don't really have to push that far. And as soon as it, oh, 170, in fact. And as soon as it comes anywhere close, we will take that as a, as a good one. And we're just going to wait our way down until we get down to Periap, where we make just a simple circularization burn. I do wait just a little bit beforehand because we want to get rid of this back end here. Um, I, I make the, 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 the call to get rid of the, the just a little bit of the fuel so that we can end up flying around just with this ship and indeed we put it into a nice circular orbit and just have to wait 
until morning so we can take Richmond out for a flight, which should be easy enough. I mean, all we need to do is travel this five kilometers underneath the gaze of the Kerbin system to make our way over there. And you know, it, it's, it's simple. It's a five kilometer drive. What could possibly go wrong? So we go into IVA view and we just uh, have a little bit of a, a, a trundle around because, well, this is nice. Unfortunately, for some reason, and I still don't know why, I didn't turn my SAS on. And you will see here that I still do not have my SAS on. Um, uh, so this can really only end badly, especially when your wheels come off that far off the floor. Um, I, I did manage to put my SAS off in, on in the end, but it was too late. Smashed everything up and I'm just like, oh, my life. Take it from me. Take it from me now. Okay, so a small re reload take a small drive and we eventually get into the right area here and we manage not to crash into the bang zoom which i think is just a uh, something to be to be celebrated really with everything that's gone wrong so far this episode a any any win is a win okay so the first thing i want to do rearrange that fuel port and then i want to try and take all this stuff and put it onto my vehicle that is right i'm going to turn a 30 part vehicle into much more um unfortunately i blow everything up um this is crap this is rubbish. So I reload because I managed to quick save right here. I, so much had gone wrong. So much had gone wrong that I just quick saved as, as soon as I got there this time. Um, and despite my best efforts, it turns out that you can't actually kill um, Richmull just by flying him badly. At least not on, on his AVA gear. I, I really did try. Uh, well, I, I didn't try, but it look, really does look like I tried if you watch what's going on here. Um... But yeah, I reckon two new solar panels and another battery. The battery was kind of the important part out of the, this extra equipment. Well, the important part was obviously the fuel. Um, but the battery was also important because this, this doesn't actually have a battery on it. So if we even slightly go onto the night side, that's it. All control has been lost and that, that's not what we want. Um, I found it much easier to control the Kerbals zoomed in like this. I'm not sure if other people have this. Maybe I'll just spend too, many too much time playing as like third-person RPGs or something. But that's definitely what I found. And there we go. We've got our fuel pump finally uh, underway. Now, the difficult point here is there wasn't enough fuel here to completely fill up uh, what I was doing, fill up my, my tank. So I had to kind of fiddle around as... as fiddly as it was kind of starting and stopping the flow trying to get this as balanced as possible and i was only one unit of liquid fuel out from either side so i'm actually quite quite pretty pleased with that um i managed to get my oxidizer bang on and of course we brought a temp temperature probe uh, or as we like to call it a thermometer with us and i found this kerbal conveyor belt here um, I'm not sure what was going on there. I could not control Richmore why that was happening at all. He was just kind of gliding along um, do doing his thing. And now we get to move on finally after ooh, 17 minutes or in real time four hours to going around to do, try and do what the mission was that we were supposed to do. Uh, so the first thing we need to do is get up 10,000 uh, 10, meters, that is 10 kilometers above the surface at the same point where this navigation marker is. Now, I think it's easy, but every time that I've thought that something's easy, it's been difficult. So we're just gonna have to hope, pray to the Kerbal gods. The Kerbals have gods? There must be a god of rockets or engine exhaust, like the, a god of journeys at least. Ah, oh, strange. But anyway, the first one happened. The, 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 just round of applause, guys. Yay! First one went well. Okay, and now we need to get over to that direction. I, I can't do any better than the direction we're pointing at. Fly over the top of our overnight stay and kind of drift down the other side. Heading slowly but surely towards the Kerbal Hall of Fame where all good Kerbonauts go to spend the rest of their days. Obviously as the first sort of proper surveying mission of the moon, Richmond is all but guaranteed guaranteed a place in there right next to jeb probably because jeb doesn't have to do anything to get this sort of uh, accolade it turns out jeb's just jeb uh and there finally we've entered the, the the zone we have done our mission report we've got the flashing green lights in the corner and i say thank you very much for joining me for this absolute debacle of a mission i will see you next time where maybe we're going to do some more stuff with richmond maybe we're going to buy patch conics and go to minmus let me know in the comments which one you want to see. Bye! <laughs>